You are an author, columnist, you've done documentary films, you're a senior fellow at Stanford's uh, Hoover Institution. You specialize in the study of race relation, multiculturalism, affirmative action. You hold a PhD in English from the University of Utah, an MA in sociology from Southern Illinois University, a BA in political science from Coe College, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Your latest book, it was a great, it's a great book too, is Shame, How America's Past Sins Have Polarized Our Country. White guilt is, a, is the terror of being seen as a racist, uh, as a bigot that now pervades American life. All our social policy, our, our culture, uh, everything is touched by this anxiety in most of white America, understandably, given America's history, that they're vulnerable, they have this vulnerability to being uh, disarmed of moral authority uh, uh, by being called a racist. I can use it as a weapon. I can say, you know, I went on the Levin show. Let me tell you the way I was treated. And big, it, it's gonna, it explodes. Uh, so it, it constitutes, that is black power. White guilt is black power. They're, they're virtually one and the same. And one of the big problems we have is that you talk about universities and, and political correctness and so forth. These are all ways in which white Americans say, I'm innocent. I don't feel this way. I, I'm not a bigot. I'm not a racist. I'm, uh, I'm innocent. And their white guilt causes this drive to prove and establish innocence. And so then, we have a whole generation of black leaders who do one thing and one thing only, milk white guilt. Could the culture be turning, but the elites digging in? That's well said. Because more and more when I watch these debates on television and so forth, people very easily, almost casually, call people they disagree with racists. If they disagree with a political agenda, if they disagree with a particular issue, and most of that's coming from the left. Yes. What do you make of that? Well, it's, um, it's, it's white guilt is, uh, is it, it, it just, meant to disarm you of moral authority. It's uh, they, when they scream racism all the time, they're saying, you're a racist. You don't have the moral authority to deal with whatever issue or problem we're dealing with uh, because you're, you're a racist. And so therefore you are morally compromised um, and you, your moral authority, uh, you don't have any moral authority. Uh, and I, and the, the, this is the seduction that uh, people on the left have fallen for. Because whites are still so vulnerable to that charge of being a racist, that is the power, the, the entire, all of the power of the American left is based on that, that guilt that susceptibility, that terror of being seen as racist. Um, not to introduce the presidential campaign, but Hillary Clinton in her deplorables statement, now famous, uh, is a perfect example of saying, these people are bigots and racist. I am innocent. You vote for me, you prove your innocence. I offer you an identity of innocence. Being liberal, being left, is, is more an identity than anything else. It's the way I think of myself as a decent, civilized human being. Um, and those other people are contemptible. Um, uh, and so it, 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 it works on a cultural level. Uh, it, now I think the irony is that, that um, this is, this is beginning to fade. You begin to, you see signs of, of it cracking at this point that, that uh, people don't take Maxine Waters seriously anymore. That's not Martin Luther King. When he came along, there were obvious, terrible things, this terrible discrimination behind every word he spoke and everybody knew it and there was really no debate about it. Uh, racism was everywhere. When the era of Maxine, as we some people now call it, 
there's nothing behind the protest. But if you have a political uh, mindset or a political party or a political ideology that, was, that has to sustain this argument, even though, as you say, th this is a horrific past, but we're free. But the Democrat Party, not all the people in the Democrat Party, but many of the spokesmen and leaders of the Democrat Party, they're not free from this. No. Is it because it's, they, they, they seek to keep people or stigmatize people? Or what's yeah. that all about? If, if the, the, the essence of American liberalism, I think, is, the, again, the, the pursuit of innocence, uh, innocence of specifically the ugly American past, if, and that's why, uh, because I am free of that ugliness and innocent of it, that's why you should vote for me. That's why you should let me change this aspect of the university system. That's why you should let me do any number of other things. Not because I have better ideas, that I'm a better problem solver, but because I offer this, this identity of innocence which is now the, I think, big political problem that we, we, we have not identified up to this point. Uh, but it is that susceptibility, that vulnerability in the political arena, people are going to play on it. They're going to exploit it. I can make you, I can, and I've seen this, as spent my, my adult life in universities, and, and you see reasonable, civilized, decent people just fold up and uh, when the charge of racism is even hinted at, uh, and they begin to sell out the quality of the university, the one thing they inv invariably always absolutely do is lower standards. Remove Western civilization from the curriculum. What are you doing? You think that's going to make you innocent. It makes you stupid. It makes you destructive. Mm -hmm. uh, and black Americans, we need to understand the uh, magnificent, careful evolution of Western civilization as much as anybody else does. Mm -hmm. So you're keeping us from it and saying, well, it's not, it's a bunch of white guys. It's, I don't care. I need to know uh, and be informed. I need to identify with Western civilization. I am a Western person. Black Americans are a Western people. We evolved here in the West, thankfully. In some cases, longer than most other Certainly. immigrants or peoples who are in this. Certainly. We've been here since the very, very, very beginning and, and uh, so forth and shot the first shot in the Revolutionary War, uh, Christmas Maddox. And, uh, and so this is it. Um, and now we're in a position, and I understand this as a black person, when you come out into freedom after that, and every, the society admits it was wrong, uh, and you come out suddenly into freedom, you're going to say, well, something is due me. You did that to me for three centuries. Is something due the person? And there may be something due. I don't, that's, America tried its best to, you know, we've got a tr several trillion dollars on social programs and wars on poverty and so forth. We've tried to do that. Uh, and it hasn't worked. And that's the realization I think we're just about getting to, is that, yeah, we had a hard time. I had to watch my father be discriminated against in every way. The unions wouldn't hire him, wouldn't, wouldn't take him in. Uh, so I know all about it. And there's a part of me that says, wait, whoa, I'm not ready to fully identify with America yet. That's a, that's a bit of a stretch. The cold fact is it doesn't matter we, we can't change the past we can only move into the future and in the future we have to identify with this country it's the greatest country there ever was there's no where, what other system are you gonna gonna go to um and and it's hard emotionally for a people to say well, we need to get some sort of a paycheck something for what we went through some reparation that's what reparation, the discussion, it's a psychological um, sort of imposition of what justice, you know, in some cosmic way should be. Uh, but 
we're, that kind of justice doesn't very often exist in real life. And if you look at history, you, you see other people have been set free. They didn't get paid off for their suffering. Uh, we're not going to get paid off for that. And if we keep holding out, demanding that, we will pay the price. We'll get weaker and weaker.